carbon is not a particularly plentiful element. It makes up only about 0.025% of Earth's crust, yet it forms more compounds than all the other elements combined. Its transformation represents a biogeochemical process that moves thousands of millions of tons of this element every year between the atmosphere, the biosphere, the geosphere, and the hydrosphere. This carbon cycle constitutes a sequence of events which are key to Earth's capability of sustaining life. It has been operating and fluctuating for millions of years. During the last two centuries, human activity has severely altered this cycle, producing a metabolic disequilibrium. 407 parts per million. This is the current concentration of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere, which represents a 47% increase since the beginning of the Industrial Age. This increase in the level of atmospheric carbon concentration in addition to the capacity of this element to retain and store heat is producing a constant increase in global temperature, provoking deep changes in climate patterns. Thousands of scientists and experts continue proclaiming the myriad of disastrous implications of surpassing the 1.5 degrees barrier. The sequence of several climatic disasters, such as recurring floods, droughts, desertification, wildfires, will not only cause direct damage, but also lead to chains of catastrophic events, such as massive migration, socio-political instability, pandemics, or even open-armed conflicts that will cost trillions of dollars and millions of lives. But if we know this, if we know what is causing climate change and what are the disastrous relays that it will unfold, then why don't we have a plan for it? If climate change is itself a result of inappropriate infrastructural management of both natural and anthropogenic infrastructures, then human beings are not only capable of altering climate conditions, but are able to organize new terraforming process that will be deliberately planned and managed to counter the ongoing accidental one. Among the most serious problems that this plan faces remains the lack of proper planetary ecosystem governance. Climate change challenges the Westphalian system of sovereignty which does not seem to be able to manage planetary metabolism. That goes beyond the territorial boundaries of nation states. Recently, several institutions, both national and international ones, have published a series of measures trying to face this lack of ecological agency. These proto-policies are branded under the name of Green New Deals, and the outcome of their proposal means a whole reconfiguration of society, economy, and productive forces of labor. But what exactly is the Green New Deal? The name refers back to the American New Deal, a set of social and economic reforms to counter the Great Depression of the 1930s. The additional term green refers to the necessity to include ecological administration as an essential task for which the state should be responsible. Despite the peculiarity of the different Green New Deals, the most important basic premise that they all share is a fundamental shift in the logic of federal sovereignty from the governance of societies to the governance of ecosystems. This is a huge shift in the very definition of the political as such, and implies to understand ecosystems as complexly interlinked entities that include human societies entangled among other ecologies. Recently, the number of these green policies have been growing as a result of the increasing level of awareness in relation to climate change issues. They have been promoted by several national and supranational entities like the C40 or the EU, 
but due to the lack of real jurisdictional agency, none of these proposals has been fully implemented. A comparative analysis of Green New Deals shows that even though they all seek to redirect governance towards ecosystem control through cataloging a wide array of similar political measures, they may differ substantially from each other in the scope, scale, enforcement, and the socioeconomic paradigm where they operate. To frame the Green New Deal as a governance problem-solving mechanism means to understand the limitations that these proto-policies encounter from a legislative point of view. A Green New Deal is not a bill nor a legislation. It's not even a policy proposal. It is nothing that any jurisdictional organism can pass and make law. They are just the first step. These guides frame a common understanding of the problem and settle a set of goals aimed to avoid global disaster. But they do not set the methods of achieving those goals, nor do they picture the consequences of accomplishing them. For example, reaching zero net carbon metabolism between 2030 and 2050 implies reshaping a whole network of industries directly connected to the fossil fuel industry, rethinking the transportation systems, transforming the building industry towards new efficiency standards, the reorganization and decarbonization of the supply chains, or a radical shift in the energy production and distribution networks. The transition to a new energy regime does not just mean displacing the fossil fuel sector from the global economy, but more importantly, reskilling and reorienting an entire workforce toward new means, creating a whole economy based on investment and developing the necessary technologies for the post-fossil fuel sector. This is, by all means, a remarkable task that, if not well managed, could lead to a huge social and economical breakdown. But this is why the Green New Deals also incorporate a social and economical dimension to the infrastructural policies they propose. To understand the magnitude of this radical infrastructural shift, means to comprehend how societies and the economic processes driving them are deeply entangled with ecosystem management. Therefore, social security and economic stability must be provided during the transition period. This materializes in a set of promises, aiming to avoid the recoil of moving away from fossil fuels while guaranteeing social rights and equality among the most vulnerable communities. Job and housing guarantees, social and economic benefits, public health care systems, free access to education and training. These are basic elements of economic freedom ought to be promised to every citizen in the world and are the only means through which a viable transition can be accomplished. However, the way these social warrants could be achieved remains mostly unspecified. To fulfill these goals means to adopt a mixed economic model that incorporates elements of a free market economy and a planned economy, including broader social and ecological considerations within the neoliberal market. The complexity that this model possesses in relation to society, as well as the economy, the manufacturing industries, the logistics of goods and information, and the infinite bureaucracies between them, will require the establishment of an institution capable of intervening in the regulation and coordinating of all the parties involved. This hypothetical organization must be legitimized by employing, assisting, and supporting a large part of the population while at the same time being competent, making the decisions and seeing them implemented. To do so, it must have sufficient resources and qualified personnel. To deflect the fear of big government or big corporations, it has to include mechanisms of public ownership and control. 
And since the metabolic malfunction that provokes climate change operates at a planetary scale, this institution must be able to operate in the same way, bypassing the jurisdictional limitation of national borders in order to guarantee proper ecosystem management and also act as a climate and security buffer against climate change related events. Lastly, it should possess a long planning horizon, efficiently financing and conducting critical research and development of new post-fossil fuel technologies and techniques. There currently seems to be no institution that possesses such capabilities at the scale and scope needed. However, there are several existing organizations that match some of the social and infrastructural requirements of the Green New Deal, which make them potential candidates to be repurposed for such a role. With regard to the social dimension of Green New Deals, there are many historical precedents of social security mechanisms and social protection systems, some of which are still in place today. A clear example are the so-called welfare states of most developed countries, which consists of a model of sovereignty in which the state finances a number of public institutions that guarantee a set of social services to all inhabitants of the country. The main limitation of the public welfare system is that it is constrained by national jurisprudence associated with an independent sovereign state. Nevertheless, there are other social structures that function internally as welfare states without responding to specific national or territorial bodies. These so-called dual power institutions are platforms that can coexist with other sovereign entities and become an alternative governance mechanism without formally challenging legal structures. There is a large historical catalog of these anomalous patterns where religious structures around the world are a good example. These nations within nations work internally as socialist platforms that use their resources to the benefit of their members. In that sense, they can act as transnational welfare states. Some capitalist companies may also function as welfare states, providing subsidized housing or education to their employees, or even become a socialist real estate apparatus, constructing entire cities to relocate its workforce. Companies such as Walmart, or Amazon are now planetary behemoths that operate internally as centrally planned economies. And Silicon Valley tech colossus builds entire monotowns where all the services are included for their employees. However, the first organization that offered this type of social benefit is by far the biggest dual power entity nowadays, the military. Since the time when prehistoric tribes had a separate caste of warriors, subsidized by others to devote all their time to training and raids, the military has remained a privileged stratum of society. Today, the military is the last Keynesian remnants in the neoliberal world. It is a massive welfare state on its own. The social security of the military is a series of almost universal benefits for the military and their families. It is a multi-billion dollar apparatus whose accounts only in the U.S. are almost 50% of the budget of the U.S. Department of Defense. This is regarding the social security mechanism. But what about the production and infrastructure efforts that the Green New Deal implies? What are the institutional candidates capable of handling such an outstanding task? Decarbonizing ecosystems implies transforming existing industries and reorienting them towards building a new infrastructure regime. It will require an institution capable of mobilizing a huge workforce both human and technological, but at the same time qualified to deal with tendering, contracting, budget allocation, supervision, compliance, and evaluation. 
Several construction companies are already doing this at one level or another. Companies such as ACS or Hoktif are mega corporations that build and develop infrastructures, both civil and industrial, and are present in hundreds of different countries. Interestingly, throughout history, a lot of construction has been done by military engineers and builders from Roman legions building intercity roads to Russian engineer troops at some point outnumbering the rest of the ground forces. The interdependence of the industrial sector and the military establishment became more pronounced than ever in the 20th century when the military industrial complex was born. This manufacturing device formed by the state, the military, and several industries drove the world's most powerful economies during the Cold War with its ability to repurpose whole sectors of the economy. The machinery of the military-industrial complex is today more powerful than ever. Strongly privatized and diversified, it could be rebranded as a military-corporate complex that operates worldwide as a transnational network of multiple agents constituting a multi-billion research and development mechanism with a global budget of 1.8 trillion US dollars that could be reoriented to more relevant goals. A substantial amount of civil technologies that constitute nowadays infrastructural networks are subsidies with its origin in the military establishment. Consider for instance the history of computation or the first weather monitoring and prediction system as a specific example of this. There is also one more quality that makes the military a valuable candidate for this institutional role, and this is its logistical capabilities. Logistics is defined as the ability to organize and implement the necessary tools and techniques to achieve a particular goal. Today, they are needed in a world where flows of goods, energy, and information operate on a planetary scale. Although the military logistics apparatus is not larger than many other commercial logistics platforms, such as Amazon or Alibaba, it remains the most efficient because of its adaptability, flexibility, and resilience, with the ability to act where logistics networks do not exist. These complex operational skills are directly combined with the enforcement capabilities of the military to perform several tasks that any other organization is willing to undertake. During the Chernobyl disaster, it was the military with its famous liquidators, or when China decided to build a large green wall to stop the Gobi Desert, where more than 60,000 soldiers were deployed to carry out the task. Other actions such as disaster relief, humanitarian assistance, and peacekeeping operations have become the daily basis for the military, and many of them are directly or indirectly related to the implications of warming the planet. In fact, the military is well aware of the consequences of climate change. The annual reports of the world's major defense agencies position climate change as one of the greatest threats. Reaching this point, knowing how the military organization can act as a social guarantee platform while deploying its infrastructural resources to operate as a highly sophisticated logistic network on a planetary scale, it would be unfair to overlook the military establishment as a potential candidate to fulfill the institutional gap created by the Green New Deal's demands. A question then emerges. Does that mean that the military as we know it is the solution to the GND demands? No. Does this mean that it is a good proto-platform from which to build a post-military establishment? The one that properly managed and repurposed 
could become a great asset to enforce proper ecosystem management? This, at least, seems very logical. But if that is the case, which are those points addressed by the GNDs where the military should be improved to become an ecological force? Remember that the most basic premise that the GND implies is a shift in the role of the state from the governance of societies to the governance of ecosystems. And the military is part of the state. So in that sense, the accomplishment of the GND policies implies the repurposing of the military toward ecosystem management. This means not only the militarization of the green, but also the greenization of the military as two processes that necessarily have to converge. The military has always tried to recruit the most competent personnel to ensure the accomplishment of any given mission. However, this expertise is not currently focused on ecosystem management. By changing its role toward environmental protection, the military should incorporate a huge amount of experts in relation to its new purpose. Engineers, biologists, climatologists, architects, or economists would form the vanguard of a new global platform prepared to enforce an adequate terraforming plan. Worldwide, the military industry employs directly more than 20 million people. And that is without taking into account the thousands of contractors connected to the military industrial complex. However, this is not enough. A new military, where every citizen from 16 to 60 is enrolled, not only would create a huge social insurance platform, but also a colossal human and technical terraforming force. In the same way that the military industrial complex redirected a whole labor force toward a war economy during the 20th century, it's not difficult to imagine its repurposing toward the creation of a new counter climate change industrial regime. The current climate crisis offers an everlasting enemy upon which a whole new economy can grow. Military contractors competing to develop the best carbon capture technologies or multi-million investments in R&D will not only be essential to fix the current metabolic malfunction, but will also create millions of new jobs and a large number of technological subsidies for the benefit of generations to come. However, the military remains unmentioned even if it seems to be already fulfilling some of the characteristics of that hypothetical institution demanded by the GNDs and stands out as the most reasonable candidate to address the ecological emergence, there is still not a single mention of the military in any of the Green New Deals. Not a single one. Perhaps it is time to talk about the elephant in the room and confront how existing institutions could be properly repurposed to address issues of global necessity. If the Green New Deals are just the first step, probably the more logical next one would be to advocate for a Green Military New Deal. A proposal that in order to become feasible, should not only to include the military as the relevant institution that it is, but to actually enforce its repurposing as the main mean through which a Green New Deal can become viable. <laughs>